Allow me now, ladies and gentlemen, to invite to the podium Mr. Sam Bickerstead, Chief Executive of Climate and Development Network, the United Kingdom, for his remarks. Thank you, Right Honourable Prime Minister, Honourable Secretary of Ministry of Science, Technology and Environment, Chair of the LNC Board, fellow um, panelists, friends, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning and namaste. I'm sure many, all of us here today will agree that the sooner the world cuts its greenhouse gas emissions, the smaller the rapidly increasing resource requirements for adaptation will be. And as we've already heard, the IPCC's fifth assessment has told us that greenhouse gas emissions are growing faster than ever, and the world's carbon budget will soon be exhausted. And according to the IPCC, if we keep emitting greenhouse gases at the present rate, the world is on track, unfortunately, for an average warming of between 3.7 and 4.8 degrees by the end of this century. And we need to bear in mind these starting statistics and concerns as we to gather here. And although the focus on developing countries is rightly on adaptation, many will agree that there is an opportunity for all countries to contribute to the collective effort to reduce emissions by creating an enabling environment for investments in low emissions um, and carbon resilient uh, investments in sectors such as <coughs> agriculture, energy transport, and construction. And it's true that the IPC's recent report does provide some good news. It's, there is growing evidence that says that taking action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions can reduce, provide both development and climate benefits. Co-benefits are really large through the recent IPCC reports. But we actually know a great deal. We know enough now to act and to act effectively to reduce society's climate-related risks. And the power of CBA that we gather for the eighth time to celebrate in many respects is that it harnesses the local capacity and the resources, builds on indigenous knowledge, uh, and recognizes the potential of all autonomous adaptation. And there's plenty of action that you've seen here in Japan and that you, that you yourselves are part of. Some of the experience of CBK and its partners from, for example, the city of Cartagena in Colombia, which has created the adaptive neighborhoods uh, in, uh, with, with communities and municipalities and business in the face of increased flooding. How communities in Ethiopia, Uganda, and Mozambique are reprogramming their district development budgets to more climate resilient activities to benefit local livelihoods. How climate resilient housing in Da Nang in Vietnam is saving lives and property in the face of typhoons. And here, with the government of Nepal, the CBK is, is, is very pleased to be launching a report on the economic impact uh, assessment of climate change across key sectors, where the, set, the costs of various sectors of adaptation is being explicitly pulled together. These are great examples, and you will know many more. But I think we know, as, as the previous CBA conference has said, there is still very large scaling up the challenge. And we know that the finance, the focus of this conference, is critical to this. Of course, the international climate finance is expected to deliver a huge range of things and work at a range of scales. And it, and it will need to be challenged to, to drive transformational change at these various levels. And this has already happened through the GEF and the Adaptation Fund, and at national level, through national climate change funds such as Planella in Rwanda. But as the CPA's annual climate finance landscape report tells us, Despite increased commitments by donors to adaptation, in 2012, according to CPI, 94% of the $360 billion spent on climate finance was focused on mitigation. CPA data also tells us that most climate finance originates in the same country in which it is spent. So some 75% of finance that's raised for climate finance is delivered in that same country. And I believe that by demonstrating a national commitment and a trend in increasing of such resources, that developing countries are in a strong position to make the, the, the case for increased support for international climate finance to the various institutions. And here in Nepal, we've seen our hosts taking real action to do this at the local area. We've heard about the matters, and their leading role in the LDC group with the demonstrations of commitment that the government of Nepal has made. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I would say that international climate finance needs to enable 
adequate resources for developing countries to pursue their transition to low carbon and climate resilient economies. These resources, of course, will need to be considered as catalytic and used in a way that shifts larger sums of investment from the public sector and the private sector to drive the, the broader transformation to climate resilient societies. And this does mean that at all levels, from national, international, and local level, long term planning <coughs> and strong institutional capacity will be necessary to effectively access and deliver climate funds. And I think many of you are part of that, and the CDKN um, stand very much ready to continue to partner with you and others in making this happen. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.